Thank you all for coming out tonight. We're very excited to have you here. We're very excited to partner with ON for this great event. We have three amazing guests, three very unique people. I'm going to let them introduce themselves, and then we'll get the discussion from there. So to kick it off, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Tucker. Um, and I'd love to hear about your backstory and what you bring to the table. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Uh, I'm actually a neurologist, and I practice in Essex, Connecticut, and I've been there for like 40 years. But my athletic career started in about 1968, thereabouts, when I was running um, with the UDT team down in Key West, Florida, as part of their medical coverage down there. And wouldn't you know that we were running, and we were, every day at 6 o'clock, we were up when we were running. And we were running along, and all of a sudden, we had to run up this hill, there's a big there's no hill in Key West, said, so no they built the hill. <laughs> yeah, they, so they built this huge thing out of coral, right? So we run up the hill, and I can barely make it to the top. And I feel these two arms kind of grab me and move like that. Make it over the top. We're going the other way. Now we're coming back. And I'm thinking, oh, we got to go over that hill again. And I hear this, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. And I look up, and there are eight guys carrying a telephone pole up the hill. And you know who they are? The SEAL team. And they have a regimen, and they have a routine, and they follow that routine every day. Their 30-minute run consists of carrying that telephone pole up the hill and down the other side. And their idea is, if they're strong and tough mentally, they can do anything. So I got started doing that. And then I started, got a little better, and I was on the submarine off the coast of Russia and a bunch of stuff. But, so I go to Yale, become a neurologist, and now I'm looking around, what am I going to do? So I started running. And I started running five miler. So I'm like, ooh, this is a long way. And within like 1980, I started running a marathon. I go, this is pretty cool too. Because everybody back in the 80s, you know, that was like nobody ran marathons. You really wanted to do one. So I did like 11 of them in four years and three ultra marathons, including this thing in California called the quadruple dipsy and stuff. And then I got bitten by the triathlon bug. So in 1984, <laughs> since now I could run and I could swim because I was in the Navy and I was riding bikes all the time in the meantime anyway, so I did the Ironman in Hawaii in 1984 when there was like 900 people out there doing it. And that was really cool. So that was my last real marathon. Not, no, not right. I did a bunch <laughs> of half, half Ironman and stuff for a while. And in 96, my wife says, well, we're going to have to do the Iron Man together because she'd already done one in 93. So we did it in 96 together. And that was my really last marathon that I've done. But I've been doing triathlons ever since. And the endurance aspect of triathlon has carried me through now. I'm 76 years old. I'm pretty comfortable in my skin and I do stuff pretty well. But it's because I have this balance, I think, between competing and enjoying my training. And for me, the love of running and swimming and biking keeps me going. I also have one other issue that's a problem. My wife right now is uh, number one in the United States for women over 65 in triathlon. So <coughs> we're training a fair amount. <laughs> <laughs> and the first part of our talk is going to be a little bit about how you set up routines. I can tell you all that. <laughs> Wow, that's excellent, Dr. Tucker. That's a hard act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. Um, I'm Mary Arnold. I'm on the uh, brand and consumer engagement side for Jackrabbit. I see a lot of familiar faces here. Uh, when I'm not in stores or traveling around the country, I'm uh, world ranked at the 100 mile distance. I have a 100 mile race this Saturday. Um, people ask all the time, how do you do this? How do you make it work? And the answer is, I just kept trying stuff till I found something that worked. Honestly, um, interesting fact that most people don't know, uh, 15 years ago when I started running, I was 200 pounds um, and could barely make it down the block. I didn't have any formal training. Uh, and my idea of exercise or, you know, cross training at that point was drinking 12 beers a night. So um, <laughs> thankfully we're not doing that anymore. And I've, I've learned a lot along the way and I'm happy to pass along what I've learned. Um, it's a little different. It's a little unorthodox. I think Dr. Tucker's medical advice might be a little more sane. Uh, but um, when you're... When you're really deep down in it and you just need to find the motivation to keep going, I think I have a pretty good beat on that. <laughs> Great. And my name is Kelly Roberts, and I blog at the blog Run Selfie Repeat. 
Uh, I was never athletic growing up. I would then the person that would sprain my ankle to get out of running in PE. <laughs> <laughs> but I lost my brother in 2009, and I gained a lot of weight, and at over 200 pounds, I decided I wanted to get my life back. So I didn't run, but I slaved away at the gym and hated every single second of it, and I ate nothing but boring food and uh -huh. lost the weight. And then I graduated. I got my undergraduate in theater. And going to school for theater is kind of like going to Hogwarts. It's cool to tell people, but like no one cares. Like, what are you going to do? So I moved home with my parents and kind of just sat and felt sorry for myself. And I was confused and I was sad. And then one day I woke up and I felt like I needed to move. And it was Thanksgiving, but the gym was closed. So I said, I'm going to go for a run. So I put my shoes on and I took off and got to my mailbox and was gonna die <laughs> but for some reason suffering felt better than going back and getting into bed so I kept going and two months later I ran a half marathon and then a couple months later I ran my first full marathon and it was horrible <laughs> super duper painful but it helped me get the courage to move to New York and a couple months later I uh, ran a half marathon because I was about to break up with the guy I was seeing and I was feeling sad and I took selfies with hot guys behind me <laughs> to make myself laugh. And, and then a celebrity was born. And now I'm a professional athlete. <laughs> no, I'm not. But I, I wanted to create a platform for new runners who thought it felt impossible but still did it because it helped them get through their day and there's something empowering about putting one foot in front of the other, as cheesy as it sounds. Like for some of us, it's like the only thing we can do to get through the hardships. So that's my shtick. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, so as you can see, everyone's pretty unique, and they all have their very different backstories. Um, so tonight, we really wanted to talk about the aspects of how to really finish a marathon mentally and to use that brain to get across that finish line. So today, the first talking point, tonight, the first talking point that we're going to touch on is the routine and kind of the routine that you set up for you mentally to get there and through your training. So Dr. Tucker, if you want to start talking about some routine topics. Then. You bet. As you all know, your adrenaline levels are important. Your adrenaline levels are really important if you are going to run fast. You need a lot of it. If you're going to run a marathon, you don't need a lot of adrenaline. You need to be calm, cool, and relaxed. You need to do, when I get ready to go to that long distance race, I have to know that I've been there before, I've done it before. There's, there's a recent article actually in one of the USA triathlon things about setting up a routine. So if your race is going to be say at 8.30, you want to be up at least three hours before, three and a half is better. So you get up at five and you get up at five every morning and you know what it's like to be up at five. So you eat the kind of breakfast maybe you're going to have for the marathon a few days a week. The other days it doesn't count. But at least a couple days a week, you eat that food that you're going to use when you run your A race, your marathon. Then you know what is, how you're going to feel when you start to run. On the weekends, for sure, you want to be able to go out and replicate that same sensation you're going to have at the start of a marathon. You want to be able to run smoothly at the beginning. You want to be able to nourish yourself, which you've already done, but you be, you know, now your food is digested because you've waited three hours, and now you're going to be able to take in more nourishment, a lot of which is liquid, and you're probably going to need the liquid. So by the time you've done this for two or three weeks, and the marathon is the six, yes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have plenty of time that you can start to set these things up. So it's going to be like relaxed, old hat, I'm comfortable, I've been here. When the race day comes, I know exactly what I'm doing. My adrenaline levels are gonna be very low. You don't want a high heart rate. You don't want your blood pressure to be up. Back in the 60s, we had a thing called transcendental meditation. I grew up in California back in the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> and the idea was if you would learn how to relax, your heart rate would go down and your blood pressure goes down. I actually do the same thing on a triathlon now on a bike when I'm going really hard and I go like, this is stupid, why am I grabbing the bike lane? And I kind of go, whew, let it go and my heart rate goes down and my speed goes up. And you'll see the same thing when you're running. If you can get that state of relaxation and sort of like I've been here, I've done this, I know what it feels like, and then you go. <laughs> Brilliant, yeah, great advice. Uh, to echo Dr. Tucker's comments, nothing new on race day. It should feel 
like the most boring, typical, normal Saturday. Now it's tough because you may have to get up an hour earlier to get to the Staten Island Ferry or to get to the bus or if you're at one of the Disney marathons, and I'm just going to spoil it for anybody who hasn't done a Disney <laughs> race, um, you're going to be very, very far away from the start and you're going to have to walk in the dark and think, why didn't I bring a flashlight? So there are things that are going to upset your routine, but as normal as you can make it, as calm, as steady, as even eat the same foods, make sure your gear is tested, and understand what things could come up, because if you can troubleshoot those ahead of time, you'll be in a better position. Um, I eat the exact same breakfast every single morning before I train. I uh, I wear the exact same kit for all of my races, except for you know adding a layer or two depending on the weather. Um, and I even make a routine out of taking my nutrition. I know a lot of you guys are probably in a spot right now where you're testing new things. One week it might be, hey, let's try the cliff shot, okay. And the next week it's, hey, let's try honey stinger. When you find something that works for you, figure out what the pattern is that you need and then stick with it. And uh, again, to Dr. Tucker's comments, your system digests calories uh, more evenly with a steadier burn over, um, you know, with smaller smaller amounts. So instead of eating an entire gel at a, at a, a throw, have half, I know it gets a little sticky, just hold the top, wash it down with some water, and then eat every 20 minutes. I mean, my race routine is the most boring thing in the universe. It, um, electrolytes and calories every 25 minutes, water every 45. It is the most boring thing ever, but it really helps a lot. And then when you do need to do something different, you don't have to think about it. You're not expending the energy of like, oh wait, did I take calories in at this point? Set an alarm on your watch. Every single Garmin made, except for the Garmin 15, has an interval alarm that you can set. Just make it boring, make it easy. And here's the one other thing, I don't know if you were gonna get to this in a minute, Dr. Tucker. What you do at night is almost as important as what you do in the morning. We live in New York. It's the greatest city in the universe, but it's also extremely hard to have a normal bedtime. I totally understand. <laughs> and if you guys are in the throes of training right now, you know, you're telling people, I, I can't go to dinner at nine o'clock. That's far <laughs> too late, I need to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's okay. I have no problem telling my esteemed colleague here, I am now 90 minutes past my specified bedtime. <laughs> you don't know what I'm going to say. But I, I, that's the truth. It really is. But ultimately, make sure you're getting good, consistent, quality sleep. Make sure you have a normal routine with your bedtime. And I know it sounds silly when I say bedtime, but it really is that. And I strongly encourage all of you, this is something that I picked up last year that I've done ever since, and I know it might not be feasible for everybody. Take your phone, walk it out of your bedroom, put it in your living room, put it in your closet, and get, I know, right? No. Put it, put it somewhere where you're not going to see it. Set some other methodology of alarm. I know this is like anathema, like you can't say this. But the ambient light that the phone generates, that the heat that the phone generates will interrupt your sleep cycle. It will. So put it in the other room. You'll sleep better, I promise. So again, big talking points here. Race day routine, super normalized. Try a bunch of things. Get your routine down. Race morning and what you do at night is really important too. Do we have any first time marathoners for New York? Okay. Hey! <laughs> very exciting. I think the most important thing is to know that you're going to be very scared and to, you're going to feel really panicky. I just did Chicago last, last two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Oh my God, it feels like yesterday. <laughs> it, I went for a BQ attempt, so I spent an entire six months trying to shave 18, 28 minutes off my marathon time. So that was a big chunk of my life where I didn't see any of my friends. <laughs> or I, you know, I just kicked my butt to try to make this thing happen. So the day before, like I was, I hadn't been that scared since the day before my first marathon. I cried at pasta dinner, <laughs> like I was a mess. I think the best thing you can do is to know that you're probably gonna be scared and just to acknowledge it. And that's why being prepared and having your routine is so important because those things are done. I forgot body glide, I forgot all these things. And I was like tweeting at five in the morning, like anybody staying at the West End with body line? And luckily yeah. someone was like, me! And I was like, meet me in the lobby. So what I said about the phone may not apply to her. <laughs> <laughs> it might not, just saying. But you're gonna be scared and you're gonna be nervous and you're not gonna be thinking clearly. So when you have a routine and you have everything set out, mm -hmm. that's important. You're not gonna be thinking clearly. Also the people around you. You're gonna have friends, you're gonna have family, you're gonna have people being like, how can I help you? What can I do? Tell them ahead of time, I'm probably gonna be a little nervous, I'm probably gonna be kind of scared. 
I will tell you what I need. Otherwise, just stay there. Because otherwise, they will hover and they'll be like, what can I do, what can I do, what can I do? And you're going to be like, leave me alone. <laughs> and a lot of them come out of the way. Set them up on the course. Tell them where to stay. On 91st and 5th Avenue on the left-hand side, my <laughs> left-hand side. Tell them exactly where to be. Set everything up beforehand so that if you're in the middle of a race and you're fogging out, you're not saying, where's my family? Let me get my phone out in the middle of a race and try to like text them and be like, Siri, where's my mom? <laughs> Little things that you can do to make your race day go as smooth as possible are really, really important. Be prepared. I'm the queen of getting somewhere and being like, I forgot gels. That's why these things are very important. <laughs> <laughs> Pack Beautiful. your race bag ahead of time. <laughs> Way Pack ahead of time. Right. Pack it ahead of time. Lay your list. kit out the night before. Check it twice. Yep. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So kind of going off of that and talking a little bit more about, obviously, we're putting in the miles. You guys have races that you're using to train up to these, to these key A races. So I'd like to continue the conversation talking about how to mentally prepare for these races that are coming up and use them to your advantage for that A race. Um, so Dr. Tucker. I think if you can replicate parts of the New York City Marathon course ahead of time in your runs, so when you get there, and fortunately you live here, so you can probably run a lot of it, but even if you're going to another place, you can find parts of the terrain here that you think will duplicate, and now everybody online has all of their terrain maps and stuff set up so you know exactly what the course is going to look like, and many even have videos. I know the triathlon people loves putting out videos of the course and stuff, particularly the bike course. Um, so you can replicate this thing ahead of time so you know what you're doing. Then what you do is you find races that you think will replicate parts of the marathon. So you want to be able to run when you're tired, when you're exhausted. So you pick a 10K and you start going and you go fairly hard. So you know by the time you get to like 7K, maybe 8K, you're just about done then you have to be able to figure out how to get yourself through that last two kilometers because it's going to be here. Rarely does a person's physical self give out. I mean, sometimes you get a cramp, sometimes a knee, whatever. But most of the time, what gives out is there. You're going to go, and you're going to go, and then you're going to go, oh, God, I can't do this. 21 miles, 22 miles. If you really run well, if somebody says to me, Oh, I had the best time doing that marathon. I look at him and say, <laughs> he didn't run hard enough. <laughs> you shouldn't say that. <laughs> You're just doing a walk in the park. That's not running a marathon. You know, that's me, I guess. But anyway, so you're going to go through all that stuff at the very end. And as you get to the end, there's another thing to think about. When you get to maybe a half mile to go, what happens? Everybody has this kind of like a collapse. Your adrenaline goes down, your brain slows down. Thank God I'm done. But you're not. You still got another half mile to go. <laughs> there was a the World Triathlon Championships. A guy named Jonathan Brownlee was going to win that and win the World Championships if he won that race. He had maybe I don't know four, three, four hundred yards to go. Where did he wind up? Boom, on the deck, because he could see the finish line. He knew he was there, and he went. Oh, and, you could, and my wife, just before that, had noticed his leg was kind of going a little funny. And as soon as his adrenaline level, as soon as that goal of getting across the finish line left, he went down. So you need to practice going to the end of a race and finishing the darn race and not stopping before you get there. It's going to be, extreme, it's going to be tough to do in the marathon. You're going to hurt, you're going to be tired, you're going to be this. But you can do it. It's, it's not physical. It's up here now. Get that last little bit, and you challenge yourself in shorter races ahead of time. So you know, I can do it. I can conquer that. I think that's, I think that's great. And I also um, would like to echo Dr. Tucker's sentiment of you'll pass out before you die, which is sort of like one of those ultra things, like, oh, you'll, you'll pass out before you die. It'll be fine. And I, I realize two people are laughing, and then 70 are looking horrified. <laughs> Um, but in all honesty, what, he say, what he's saying is really, is really true. Practice how you want to finish. And one of the best ways to do that is to do a little mini slice down at the end of your long run. So you have your long run pace, whatever that is. 
in the last two miles or three miles, practice taking a little bit of time off that pace. So for example, if you're a 10 minute miler and that's your goal pace for marathon, spend the last two to three miles slicing down a little bit, 10 seconds per mile, 15 seconds per mile, 20 seconds per mile, and then really push hard for that last half a mile you'll finish strong and you'll feel more confident that your body can respond because that's one of the things that people think, oh, I'm never gonna be able to kick across the finish line or I'm just so tired. From a metabolic standpoint, your fast twitch when you're running a marathon is still more accessible than your slow twitch because you haven't burned it out, you haven't been using it. So if you've got a little more fast twitch at the end and you train with it, you'll be in good shape. Lots of you guys will have um, striders or just very short intervals built into your last week of training. And you'll look at it and you go, how am I supposed to do 10 by one minute striders the week before the marathon? Here's a tip. Go over to the track on the Upper West Side, track on the Lower East Side, and just practice running through the finish line. Just take a lap and practice running through the finish line. Do it however you want, doesn't matter. Jump up in the air, do the arm <laughs> thing, do the Usain Bolt, whatever you want to do. Just maybe tell your friends ahead of time just in case they're running with you and think something's wrong. <laughs> but, but practice that. That's something that can really help you when it gets tough, especially when you get to that finish line and you think, oh, oh I just need to get there. And it happens all the time with New York. For the first timers, I'll be very honest, after having done this race four times, people come up Central Park South and they see Columbus Circle and they're like, I did it. And then they make that right turn and realize, oh, there's more race. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's unbelievable to watch. I ran with a very dear friend 10 years ago and he did the exact same thing. He's like, this is amazing. And then we turned and he went, why aren't we done? <laughs> so practice running through that finish line. That's something that can really help. Yes to both of those things. <laughs> I think the thing that helped me the most going into Chicago was I worked with a sports psychologist and he worked with me a lot on doubt because I would get these times on my training plan and I'd be like 7.45 for five miles, like are you serious? Me? No. No, 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 like that's not a nine. And during the race it was hard because I felt great for the first half of it. I was having the best time ever, I was with friends, but their time goals were a little bit slower than mine so I had to lose them and that was a hard like. Titanic moment. <laughs> but it's hard to hit your halfway point and think, okay, I have another half to go and I have to get faster. <laughs> so in those moments when you start to fog out and you start to think, how am I going to do this? We still have so much longer to go. Telling yourself, like, my only goal is to cross that finish line knowing that I gave everything I had, whatever that is. It doesn't, time goals for me, I think, are kind of tricky because for your first marathon, I think your first goal should be to finish mm -hmm. with a big giant smile on your face, mm -hmm. knowing that you did one of the hardest things in the whole entire universe. But in every single one of those moments where you start to be like, can I do this? I don't know if I can do this. I feel tired. My legs hurt. I still have so much longer to go. Tell yourself, no regrets, no excuses. I can do this. And then pick a point on the race and go forward and then smile. I think there's something about, even if you're doing this, <laughs> there's something about that and just lifting your body up and forward, you'll find your second wins throughout the entire race. There was a point in the race where like, I knew I didn't be Q, and I was getting a tiny bit down on myself, and then there was some guy who was like, Kelly, be Q or bust, and I was like, damn it! <laughs> <laughs> like, obviously he didn't know, but then I saw Dr. Bob, my sports psychologist, he came out to surprise me, and I was doing nine minute miles. I was supposed to be down in 745s. And I immediately busted out a 745 for that last 1.2 miles. You're capable of so much more than you think. And it's when you start to get down on yourself and you start to think like, I can't do this, this is hard, that your pace will slow down and you'll be miserable. Choose not to be miserable. Choose not to suffer in the marathon. It's gonna be hard. <laughs> you cannot run a marathon and not be in pain. It hurts. <laughs> but like that finish line will come and if you're able to cross that finish line, knowing that you gave everything that you possibly could, whatever that means, you can take walking breaks if you need them. Give yourself that luxury. <laughs> no one's gonna come after you and be like, no, <laughs> there's no walking in a marathon. Like if you need a two minute, take it, but then pick it up and keep going. I think that is the best thing that you can do in the marathon is to give yourself that, that permission to just go for it and see what you're capable of. 
a six minute mile and a 12 minute mile are the same distance. Yes. <laughs> Great. A couple of you guys just went, wait a minute. You get no, that <laughs> no, no way. No way. Garmin. No way. <laughs> um, Great wisdom. And just one other while I'm feeling witty, because this is probably about what I got right now. <laughs> um, when uh, when Ann Trayson, who still owns the women's world record for the 100 mile time, um, was asked how she could possibly run 100 miles, she said, I'm not running 100 miles, to which everybody got immediately concerned about her mental state at the start <laughs> of the Western States Endurance Run. And she said, I'm running one mile 100 times. Run the mile that you're in. Don't worry about the one behind you. Don't worry about the one in front. Just focus on the one that you're in. And to Kelly's point, there's going to be something really magical and cool in that mile. When you come off the Queensboro for the first time and you hear the roar and you make that turn and you realize why are people standing on hay bales in the middle of the street? <laughs> you're, that's really cool. Or the first time that you get to mile 22 and you're like, trees, yes, Central Park. And then someone goes, that's not Central Park. <laughs> there's something, there's magic, there's magic to all of that. So again, run the mile that you're in. Sorry, hi, Jack. No, you're totally <laughs> good. That's good. Happy to eat in. That's great. Great. Um, so now that you know they put in this work, they put in the mental challenges to lead up to the main race. They've done these other races. Now that they're getting up to race day and they're in the morning of, and they're they're maybe they're mentally not in that that spot that they should be. What tricks or what can they do to move forward, and how can they prepare for those mental gaps that might happen leading up to that day and that morning of the race? I may ask one question to the audience. How many people have a coach that are, is going to help them prepare and run the marathon? Couple, groovy. It's Just roughly a few. Half so a you're going to be self coached, the majority of you, correct? Nothing wrong. So you're going to pick all this stuff up. Okay. So what are you going to do on the morning of the race? You have yourself, you know, you've done your, your preparation for eating, for getting up ahead of time, you're all relaxed sort of, you're getting ready to go. Now I'm talking about just before the race starts, maybe 15, 20 minutes ahead of time. Everybody's jumping around, they're getting ready to go. What you're gonna do is go sit against the wall somewhere. You take a sh shirt, t-shirt, towel, whatever you happen to have with you, and you put it over your head, and you sit there, and you think, and you start the race, and you see yourself running with 10,000, 15,000 other people, and you're running along with them and it's nice and relaxed. And you can see yourself crossing the bridge, and you see yourself crossing another bridge. And all of this is done in a state of complete relaxation. Your heart rate's slow, you're nice and relaxed, your muscles are nice and relaxed, and you can see yourself doing all of this, and you haven't talked to anybody. So all your concentration and focus is inward, on providing a reduction in adrenaline and a reduction in stress. Now you're ready to start the race. And you're gonna try and maintain that same sense of balance, internal balance, external exertion, the whole way through the race and see how long you go. You, if you start like that, you have a much better chance of finishing like that. I had one other thing, oh no. Oh. Visit your friends after the race. <laughs> That's the best time to see them when you're done, not before. Um, it's actually, that's really good advice that I will definitely take to heart because you're going to have people in your circle of friends, folks that you might know from training, or just that one person on the Staten Island Ferry that really wants to talk to you because <laughs> they really need to talk. It's okay to take it. <laughs> so I'm pointing like this one. I'm gonna talk to all of you. It's it's okay to take that space for yourself. It really is. Whatever you need to do to prepare. To Kelly's point, if you have friends and family that are super eager to help, that's wonderful. Just know they will love you just as much the day after the marathon as they do the day before. It's okay to say, Hey mom, could you just go get a cup of coffee or something? Because I need to hang out here. Um, I think the one thing that I always come back to at the start of any race is I get to do this. 
because that's the thing, especially when you're like, oh my God, I have so much to do. I have to execute my race plan. What's that weird guy doing in my corral? Is somebody peeing on my foot? What's going on? <laughs> All of these things have happened. <laughs> Why is there someone in a unicorn costume here? <laughs> it happens. You just, you reframe, you refocus. I get to do this because that changes everything. I, um, I've had my share of races that didn't go as, as I'd planned. Um, and in the middle of the night, out in the woods, all by myself with a headlamp battery that was dying, I had to rely on that, like, I get to do this. And even though the race didn't turn out the way that I wanted, I learned a lot about myself in that moment. And I know that the next time around, things will probably be really different. So that's the big thing for race day. Keep distractions to a minimum. Keep it relaxed, and remember, you get to do this. I get to do this is probably the best gift you can give yourself. My sports psychologist had me take half two out of my vocabulary because I was constantly like, I have to go to track. I have to go do a tempo run. I have to go run. And he was saying, when you do that, you're setting yourself up for failure. You're giving yourself the option in the middle of the run to say, like, today's not my day. I'm just going to pout the whole way. So that is quite frankly the best thing you can ever do for yourself but I am actually the complete opposite like if I get nervous like power posing <laughs> is like my jam you will see me in a corral like standing like Beyonce <laughs> or like standing like this and just smiling because that helps me just mm -hmm. remember like, and breathe and everything's gonna be okay if you need an extra 10 minutes jump back a letter if you need I like starting with my friends so I'll jump back if it means I can hang out with them for the first five miles because I like distractions. And if it depends, like I just ran a half marathon this weekend with two of my loudest and craziest friends. I don't know if any of you guys do November Project, but one of the guys who started November Project was with me and we did, it was hands down the most fun half marathon I have ever done. We didn't use any time. I can't tell you what we ran. We stopped and did push-ups along the way. Like, they stopped and did push-ups along the way. It was a trampoline I, stop. There were trampolines. You know, like, I did that in the week before that. Like, I had the most serious race I've ever done in my life. And I still found ways to have fun in that. So I think you just have to figure out what works for you. If you're someone who wants to enjoy yourself and have a good time, like, that's totally okay. Do that. If you're someone who wants to have a very serious race, take it seriously. But tell yourself, you know, what works for you? If you need to be alone, be alone. If you need to like take a minute to gather your thoughts before you start and refocus in on your goal and tell yourself, I can do this, do that. Just take your time. I think not feeling panicked and like, I have to get to the start right now and everyone's starting and my crawl's up there. I need to go, I need to go, I need to go. Don't do that. Just take your time. Get where you need to go before you start. The finish line isn't going anywhere. It's ship time. <laughs> Good point. Good point. That's I, awesome. I got one more thing yeah. to say. I forgot. Uh, now, if you're racing a short race, you should never do this. <laughs> if you're racing a short race, my best sprint triathlon I ever did in my life, as I was driving to the race, I had, you know who Meat Loaf is? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I had bat out of hell. I had bat out of hell going as loud as I could in the car, and I'm way on the way. I had the best sprint triathlon in the whole world. And I was jacked up and ready to roll. <laughs> Boom! And, you know, a sprint is like a half mile swim, a 12 mile bike, or something. Out of the water in like run. nine minutes. Yeah, you know, bam, 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 like that. Getting this done. So it's a perfect thing to do. Probably before a 5K. I never tried it before a 5K, but that would be a good time to do this. Thing. <laughs> it goes the other way. You're Meat right. low. So, so kind of going off that. Because I know a lot of people now run with music. Do you see, as a, is that a benefactor? Does that actually help you mentally get to that finish line? Or is that just something that kind of numbs the pain for a little while? Is, is, is there anything really behind that? or is I that ran with music for about, um, I don't know, maybe a couple months. And then I quit immediately. I found I could not monitor my body. I didn't have a sensation of running, which gives me sort of like a flow. Um, I didn't see things around me in the environment, which I love to do when I go around the woods or even around the town somewhere. I wasn't, it, it completely separated me from what I consider to be the joy of running. And also, I, like I said, I couldn't monitor my legs and my arms and my breathing and stuff like I normally do, so I stopped. And I don't know that it's detrimental. Maybe you could do a little better if you didn't. Mm -hmm. Um, but I guess it depends a lot on your mindset mm -hmm. when you run. Do either of you 
I I have been known to crank the ACDC from time to time. <laughs> I'm gonna have to try meatloaf though. Yeah. Um, as a as a coach, I have noticed a tendency for athletes to run to the BPM of the music. So if you have something that's, let's say, we use the Beatles as an example, right? Typical BPM for them is about 110. So people will be a little bit behind the beat, which is not an ideal stride cadence. That usually puts you a little south of that 90 degrees, right? So you might be 80, 85, which isn't bad, but maybe you're over striding, your stride's a little exaggerated, you have ground contact time that's a little too long. What I would do if you really want tunes is go into your playlist and set it up by BPM, knowing that that's something you're going to need to hit. So maybe you do a little, um, a little Justin Bieber or something like yeah. that. That's like <laughs> a buck twenty, buck twenty-five. <laughs> You'll be a little closer. But literally, there's all different ways that you can slice and dice in any music player. You can actually set it up. Um, ahead of time to let it roll. If you use a music service like Spotify, it'll actually use your um, your phone's accelerometer chip to adjust based on your on your pace. So it's one of those things that, like, if you ever notice when you're running with Spotify, and that's kind of that's like my favorite thing for super long runs. It's like I slow down and I suddenly get start to get slower music, and I was like, Why am I listening to Maxwell? Like I wasn't moving that slow, and then you're like, Oh yeah, if I speed up a little bit, I get some Beyonce. So it yeah. adjusts to the like yes, mad love for Beyonce. Always. But it's one of those things that like I would. I would use it sparingly so that it has an effect when you want it. And maybe just use one earphone so you can still be aware of what's going on around you. Um, if you get to use it all the time, I think it's less effective over time. And I also think, to Dr. Tucker's point, you're less aware of what's going on. Or heaven forbid, something happens and your playlist goes south and then suddenly you're way out of your routine because you're Jam Master Flash Mega Mix 90s playlist is no longer working <laughs> and you're not paying attention to the race, you're like, where is Sir Mix a lot? He's supposed to be here somewhere. So it's one of those things. Thank you, Kelly, because like half the room went, I've never heard of that. It's on my playlist. Before. See? There you go. So it's one of those things. I would use it sparingly so it has an effect. Keep an eyeball on your BPM. And Every once in a while, it's kind of cool to listen to a podcast, too, in a long run, because you'll learn stuff. I love the Bowery Boys podcast, because I'll run to where they're talking about in the city Ooh. on their podcast, and you can string together a really interesting long run. Do you use the headset when you're running your ultra marathons? No. Competing? I, never. No, I don't. <laughs> um, battery life would never last that long, same thing. <laughs> yeah. You get to like hour yeah. 17 and be like, yo, they're Brush just off, not right? working anymore. <laughs> yeah. I've been known to sing loudly and off key, which annoys the other runners and makes them same. move faster. So that works fine. <laughs> I do both. Do what works for you. If you've done every single one of your long runs with music, do it. I agree with Mary. Do it with one earphone, especially during the bigger races. I always tell everyone, put your name on your shirt because the amount of human beings who are going to yell your name and say really, really nice things to you is what changes your life. <laughs> like if you're at mile 22 and someone's like, come on, Kelly, you're amazing. You're like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. So if you have both headphones in, sometimes it's hard to hear these people who are screaming amazing things at you who seriously will lighten your spirits and get you to the finish line. But I put my tunes in if I'm struggling. You know, like all my friends on the course always know if I'm wearing my headphones, like I'm probably not having the best day. <laughs> I put them in during Chicago because I hit 15 and started struggling, so I needed some Hamilton. <laughs> like, so in go. they went. <laughs> and I mean, that's slow, but there's something about storytelling for me that helps me like zoom in and I'm not really listening to it. I know all the words, <laughs> but do what works for you. If, if you have always done your stuff with music, don't race day decide like, I'm gonna do it without it. Keep them in your pocket. Keep it ready to go. Have your have your playlist like uh, queued up. So all you have to do is press go. You're not like, oh Jesus, where's Beyonce? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. And then have a backup playlist. Honestly, there are some times when I'll be in the middle of a race and I'm like, this sucks. You know, if you can just quickly go to the next one. <laughs> New go. York City Marathon lets you use um, no sound equipment <laughs> when you run. <laughs> No one's, gonna, no one's gonna tackle you. <laughs> they strongly recommend that you do not, or that if you do, the sound is very low. I believe that's what the official mm -hmm. guidelines say. We can't use say. it in triathlon because of the bike. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. No. oh yeah. I never. Different beast. More, <laughs> no, good point though. Great point. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Do we have any questions out here for from anyone? Like to ask our panel. 
and anything's fair game from, <laughs> from you know, life hacks to yeah, yeah. or from right. you know, to, you know, how to get famous by taking photos of attractive men <laughs> while you're running. Claim to fame. Yeah, that was actually one of my favorite BuzzFeed stories ever. I'm like, oh, good morning, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Can you all get more specific about what you eat, like? And do any of you, or have any of you ever had any kind of like digestive issues with food, especially in the early morning? Sure, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, I actually um, discovered through training and racing that I'm extremely sensitive to gluten. And it was a, something that, it, like, and it made a difference immediately when I eliminated it from my diet. I had come off of a marathon where it didn't go so well, and I had had multiple issues that impeded my race. Um, to like, you know, maybe there's something to this gluten-free thing. I switched out my breakfast waffle in the morning and my bread. That's it, and a, a gluten-free pasta. That was the only swap that I made. I lost 11 pounds in a week. I slept Ooh. better than I'd slept in 10 or 15 years, and I did a 50-miler the following week, came in second, had my best time ever. I was like, oh yeah, there's something to this. Um, in general, I have found that liquid calories work best for me when I'm when I'm running. It's a little easier on my stomach, and again, like you know, every 20 to 25 minutes, a little bit in terms of calories. Um, I focus on in my diet lots of leafy vegetables, really lean proteins. Um, I don't skimp on the cheese, though. I am a cheese <laughs> fiend. Um, I found that uh, cottage cheese or, or like a Greek yogurt before bed is actually better absorbed into your bloodstream overnight. So if you're looking for a little extra calcium, particularly women who might have early onset bone loss, that's something that can help too. Um, and I feel like the breakfast of champions is a very simple like gluten-free waffle with a little bit of Nutella and a little mm. cup of coffee. Like that's it, it's 250 to 275 in terms of calories or maybe 300 if I put a little extra Nutella on it. <laughs> <laughs> Two hours before I'm racing and I'm, I'm good to go. Um, if you're finding that you're having a lot of issues with certain food groups, I'd try switching stuff out, changing things a little bit and see if there's any real distinctive differences. And obviously if something's continuing to be a problem, I'd encourage you to talk with your physician and figure that out. Two pieces of toast, a cup of coffee, and a banana mm -hmm. for 15 years, probably. Mm -hmm. Early at 5 <laughs> o'clock in the morning, and then I'm done by 5.30, and then I go out and run maybe an hour later, somewhere in there. And I know that that's going to be digested really well, and I can race on that, I can do everything on that. And I pr supply food when I get back from my workout. Mm -hmm. I'll give myself some sort of replacement, one of the power bar things or something I still have a lot of. My son used to be the rep for them for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> they all just figured that out, Dr. Yeah. Tucker. Thank you. <laughs> He's going to crawl onto the stage now. <laughs> but but you, and then, so you replace your, basically replace what you, your energy needs, and then I can go back and I can start work that morning and go to the office and see patients and things, and my brain's pretty good. Are you getting ready for a marathon? I think people really love to complicate carb loading because it sounds like the greatest thing ever. <laughs> I, it, carb loading really is like eating like this much more carbs. I, like find what works for you. I eat really boring just because I don't have GI distress stuff, but like if you get really nervous, like I had a really bad stomach day during Chicago, like my gels weren't sitting with me because I was just so nervous, which has like never happened to me before. It's one of those things that if your stomach starts to go into GI distress during a race, the more you panic, the worse it's going to get. Stay calm. Breathe and say everything's going to be okay, and I guarantee you it'll either get better, you'll like work your way through it, or you just find a bathroom. Like there are there are a plenty, but don't eat, like don't eat a loaf of bread. Don't worry about it. Like <laughs> eat how you would normally eat. Like sweet potatoes are great. Whole grains are great. I have a bagel and a banana. You Maybe two. You do three and a half hours before Dr. Tucker? About three to three and a half hours before I'm at a race. Two hours mm -hmm. before. Yeah. yeah. Somewhere Have in there. And then, then you can start to take in your liquid nourishment yeah. that you're going to use, no matter what it is. Uh, it'll be absorbed easily. And you'll also have a little bit of extra to start with. And as far as carbo loading, we used to do really stupid stuff. And Ooh. then they quit doing that Aww. and found that it was really stupid. <laughs> so what they did is if you, if you actually cut back on your exercise level for in a schedule before you're going to do a large, a long race like that, 
you'll carbo load it automatically. You don't even have to worry about it. And you don't have to go through that depletion thing. Oh, that was horrible. <laughs> that and was then the part that everybody seems to miss was the idea that you deplete for 72 hours ahead of time and then super load. Everybody was just like, I will eat all the boxes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. And it's just sick. Mm. Yeah. I never did any good anyway. I just had the same <laughs> race times no matter what I did. Yeah. <laughs> so didn't don't, don't stress about it. And eat like you normally eat. And to Kelly's point about if you experience discomfort during the race, especially if you feel really full, stop eating or drinking for a little while till your stomach settles. Um, and another thing that may help and they typically have at medical tents will be Coca-Cola. I know that seems very strange, no. but Coca-Cola was originally designed as a syrup for colicky babies to settle their stomachs. So a little bit of flat Coca-Cola, now if you don't usually do caffeine, I wouldn't recommend it, but a little bit of flat Coca-Cola can bring you back from the dead. Yep. Hope that helps. Which is another reason for doing ultra marathons. <laughs> <laughs> if you do ultra marathons, then you can eat peanut butter sandwiches and drink Coke all you want. <laughs> that, the, guy, the guy who won the first ultra marathon that I did up in at Lake Warmog, he his energy was a hockey player, ex hockey player, and his uh, replacement during the course of the race was Coke and ice cream. And he had them all mixed up in these little containers and stuff. Ooh. And every time he came around, he'd get Coke and ice cream. And he had them like every three miles. So yeah. around the whole protein 50 mile course. Protein and the protein It was so cool. You yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you can have a great time doing it. That's a whole other, that's a whole other thing. It's just because with longer races, you tend to need to take in more food. So you need to take in smaller amounts. Um, one of the reasons why people, at least folks that I've coached, experience GI distress is they eat too close to the time that they're racing. So it's like just, you know, literally like 100 calories an hour before. So that's a gel, a couple of chews. Don't take too much. Because if you're on the Staten Island Ferry wolfing back a bagel and you're going to start in another 45 minutes, it's going to be hard for your system to process those calories because you're going to start running. Blood's going to be redirected to the extremities, and it's just going to sit there like a sad little loaf in your stomach. So, again, stick with what works, test it out, and um, make sure you're not super loaded and not too many calories. That helps. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Awesome. Other questions? Do you have any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Sure. I guess this is directed to Kelly since we're sitting in the same boat having just ran Chicago and <laughs> New York. What's your strategy to go into? So I use Chicago as my slow race, New York as the race. What's your strategy for getting through the last six miles? Of New York specifically? Yeah. I mean, you're already on tired legs from having just Race. Yeah, and then you are racing again, and really the race is last six miles. <coughs> so I'm curious how you. I I in. did it opposite. So Chicago is my fast race, and then New York is my fun <laughs> <laughs> in a race. Uh, I would say really, really rest in these two weeks. Like really recover, foam roll. I, Mary, what would you say? I wouldn't. I I mean, my coach told me not to run at all. I. Um, I right would ahead. just I would mm -hmm. do an extended taper and I would probably cut your volume by 50 to 75 percent with a focus on recovery so if you're doing you know 50 miles a week I wouldn't do any more than 25 mm -hmm. and I would make sure that you there's an active recovery so you're using an elliptical you're going to yoga you're foam rolling if you uh, have worked with a massage therapist that you really like now is probably a great time to do that um, and I would just be <coughs> very, very conscious of what you do immediately after New York as well, because you're going to be in really tired legs. That's when I would probably take an extended time off and then use a reverse taper to go back into running. So instead of, you know, I did the marathon two weeks later, all right, now I'm back to 50 miles a week, start back at 10% of your mileage, then 20%, then 30%, and work your way back in comfortably. I've done it a lot of different ways, and that tends to be the way that you get rid of the sort of the nagging little achiness, but you don't run the risk of getting hurt. I did Berlin and New York last year, and they were five weeks apart, I think, and Berlin was super flat, and New York is a little bit inclining. <coughs> but like, I was totally fine, rocked New York, had the best time ever, and still ran pretty fast. For me. You made a good point about okay. after the race, too, because when they did a survey of people running Boston back in the 80s, they discovered that the majority of the injuries, somewhere around 50 to 60 percent, occurred in two to three weeks after the race was over. Ah. So mm -hmm. you have to be very careful about what you're doing then. Mm -hmm. And you don't go enter a 5K 
or do something else like that. Having said that, what I did is after I flatted out, <laughs> my shoe flatted out in Boston, I blew up. Blew out one of those air things went bam like that. So I had, couldn't finish the race. So two weeks later, that's when I did my ultra marathon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all trained. What am I going to do now? I didn't finish Boston, so I didn't hurt myself. Mm -hmm. And then I went and did this great ultra marathon, and I had a wonderful time. Went to the marathon at 3:30, if I remember, <laughs> or something like Ooh, that. Cash. 7:07 <laughs> for 50 mm -hmm. miles. I said, yes, I never, I never beat it again. <laughs> How do you feel though? Good? Yeah, I guess my question was more mentally. But I physically oh, okay. am not tired. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. I, I find that I get very mentally tired after a marathon. I and so my question is: In the last six miles, how do you keep yourself racing on your second marathon? I think right there, like the thing is to prove to yourself that, like, how strong you are and. I, this is what I experienced because this is what I experienced the entire time. My coach had me racing all summer long. To, I don't like getting uncomfortable. Yep. I love hitting like, hitting just behind that pain threshold where you're like, God bless America, <laughs> this is just the worst. But I'm going real fast. Like I hit like maybe if this is the line, like I sit pretty right here where I'm like I'm working, but I'm smiling. <laughs> so I think hitting this place and and showing yourself like you can go here. Like, it's just a matter of proving to yourself that you can do a tiny bit further and faster and stronger than you think you can. So, I mean, like, tiny surges. During Chicago, I would, when I felt like, I kept, my coach did a really good job of getting me to a place where I could, like, call my paces. And I was manually lapping my watch, meaning, like, every time I hit a mile, I would smack my watch and it, it would tell me my time because the, the skyscrapers kind of, like, screw your GPS in Chicago. So I could be like, I'm running 830, and I would hit it, and it would be, like, 830, and I'd be like, yeah. So I think there were times when I thought I was running 820 and I would smack it and it'd be nine. And that was like, <sighs> I work too hard. <laughs> Why is this happening to me? So it's in those moments where you're like, okay, I'm gonna run, I'm gonna run at 80% to that staircase and then I'm gonna, and then I'm gonna kinda like chill out. One thing that I did a lot was if Chicago was so straight, you could kinda like see for a while when I saw a water station, I would surge to the water station and run through the water stations, grab my water, kind of chill and grab it while I was still jogging and kind of recover there. But like throw in teeny tiny little like 10, 20, 30 second pickups throughout the race just to show yourself that like, okay, I can keep going. Okay, I do have a tiny bit more in my tank. And then the whole no excuses, no regrets thing. Like what's it worth to you? How bad do you want it? You can do it. Like it's just getting uncomfortable and it hurts. Sometimes. Then you'll finish. <laughs> and sometimes too, you you know, if you see somebody that you know you've got friends and family, let's say stationed one every mile or every two miles, and they're wearing I don't know a hat made out of a flamingo or something, and you know <laughs> when you see them that that's where you are. My family for the last eleven years has placed themselves exactly on the same corner of um, the turn at Boston when you make the turn by the firehouse, and. And they're always there, and every year they have something big that goes on a telescoping flagpole that <laughs> flies over the crowd. And they have totally outdone and themselves now because they have a whole collection of minion kites that are all <laughs> attached to this flagpole. <laughs> and they don't bother people with it, but I know when I, because I tell them, okay, I'm 12, 15, I'm coming around the corner, and it, hoist the mainsail, and it's up and going. <laughs> and you can see it for like 10 minutes, you know? So it's one of those things that just knowing mentally there's something there. Um, if you happen to be a particularly competitive person and that's something that you feel like could drive you, pick somebody you're like, that guy or that gal. I'm gonna go get this person. I'm gonna go get that person. And I, I, Robin, my pal in the in the audience here, has heard me cheer, "Go get that tall guy!" Yes. To the most <laughs> petite women I can find, <laughs> and you will not. Be, wit, just lay rubber. Just just <laughs> passing some dude that's like six foot four, who's wondering who this little five foot person is. Come running by. Pick somebody off if you need to. What fires you competitively? have family stationed in certain places, or even if there's landmarks, like you know when you get into the park, Cleopatra's Needle, okay, it's downhill. I get to go down the backside of Cat Hill. Woo! When does that happen, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I would say, you know, those different types of things, and figure out what fires you and what works. Make that your goal, though, and then say yes to it. Like, don't be like, I'm gonna do it, and then get halfway through and be like, just kidding, shit. I'm at mile 20 and <laughs> And you, yeah, go for it. 
cool. Cool. Awesome. Um, Any um, more questions? Yeah. Um, I have a couple liquids questions. <laughs> Um, two questions. So one, like what would you recommend when you're drinking before the race? Like I think to be totally transparent, I'm always get very jittery. So before every race, I'm like, I have to pee. Okay, I just peed, I'm gonna have to pee again. Now I need to pee again. Like, do you guys recommend a cutoff time where you're like stopping to drink before the race? Oh, like slow, okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so here's where I apologize ahead of time for all of the phrases that are probably gonna come out of my face in the next it's 15 bound minutes. It's yeah. yeah. um, uh, Run hard, pee clear. But if you're peeing more than a couple times in an hour, you should probably slow down. The best way to test this is with your sweat rate and figuring it out with a long run. It's um, the weather outside today is actually ideal for it. But if you weigh yourself sans kit before you go out and then you run out for an hour and you come back, don't drink any water, just an hour, you'll be okay, come back and weigh yourself again and you say, oh wow, I lost a pound then you probably need 12 to 16 ounces of fluid in an hour to stay mm -hmm. adequately hydrated. It's hard for you to metabolize that much, but if you know, okay, 10 to 12 ounces an hour, mm -hmm. that's like a little cup and a half of Gatorade, I'm good. And practice with that in terms of, of your hydration level, you'll be good. Um, and just know that nerves are gonna to accelerate things. The one thing I would say for folks to be careful with in terms of liquids is excessive ca caffeine consumption, mm -hmm. especially if you're normally like a couple cup a day kind of person, because that'll just strip your electrolytes, it'll dehydrate you faster. Um, so switch to like a hot tea, like a chamomile tea or something like that. Like especially if you've had two cups before you get on the Staten Island Ferry, just get yourself a hot peppermint tea, because really what you, what you want is that hot cup of coffee in your hands. But you know, if you're going more than a couple times an hour, you should probably slow down a little. Second question. And then <laughs> would you recommend, like I, I'm starting to lean towards running with my bottles, like rather than stopping at the water stations. Like yeah. there's something about trying to drink out of those cups that's like. Waterboarding yourself. <laughs> it's yeah. like I've never <laughs> drank out of a glass before in my life. <laughs> 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 I never heard that. <laughs> You so carry your water bottles with you through the marathon? Yeah, but <laughs> I'm wondering, like I'm hearing from some people, yeah, I think that's a good idea, or other no. people, I think that's totally ridiculous. Do what's comfortable to you, people do it. I can't, I, I'm like, oh, stop on me. <laughs> but I, I'm waterboarding. I would really have difficulty <laughs> running carrying a water bottle. I can oh, cross oh, country ski with a water bottle, yeah. I guess, yeah. but I Are you going for a time goal? Work. Yeah. Huh. I would test stuff ahead of time and make sure. Okay. Um, you probably, like if you were to carry a very small bottle, let's say a handheld, like a Nathan uh, five ounce or 12 ounce that actually fits on your palm and you don't have to hold it, that's probably not a bad thing because then you got it, you can just sip it and if you need to take additional fluids from the aid station, you could. Um, the big thing with anything in your hands is if you're gripping it, then that's tightening all of the muscles here and it's mm -hmm. causing stress and tension and you might even get home and be like, what did I do? Yeah. Um, Belts are great if you want just a little too, like just two little bottles in the back because you're not thinking about it. The best words of advice I can give on this is you, you don't want to notice what you have with you. If you're like, oh my God, what's that in my pocket? What's this bouncing around? Like what? It's going to drive you nuts the whole race. So test it out. A um, couple tips with aid stations, particularly at New York. If you go to the left-hand aid stations, at least three to four tables down, those will be appreciably less crowded because the majority of the population is right-handed, so they'll go to the right-hand aid station. Oh. So go a couple of tables down, always go to the last person in the row because they get no love. The first person <laughs> in the row is the busiest man in the universe and the guy at the end's like, I got cubs. <laughs> <laughs> and point, be yeah, like, point. Hi, nice man in the windbreaker. I will take the water or Gatorade that you have. Or just sometimes you're just like right there. You know, <laughs> kind of got it. Because um, if you do that, then it's actually more efficient and it's easier for the aid station volunteers and it's also easier for you to get your fluids. And to Kelly's point, grab it. If you're not doing this already, this prevents the waterboarding. Dump half of it, even if you have to take two cups. Crumple the edge and slurp. Yeah. Jog or walk slowly and slurp. Because people that do this, and you see it, and you're just like, it makes me want to go, no! Oh my god, every time, it happens every time. So just again, controlling that consumption. And, and god, it's so bad. I, we were at mile 22 last year, just for days. I was like, we should be passing out snorkels this is terrible. So I would, I would just, you know, again, test it out and see what works for you. 
One other important note, and for folks that like noon or other like fizzy things, make sure if you're putting them in a bottle, it's a wide mouth bottle with a wide enough opening because if you put it, say, in like a Solomon, um, you know, the Solomon Hydro Flask, you guys mm -hmm. are looking at me like, no, I have no mm -hmm. idea. This, um, like a, a soft sided flask, uh, the pressure will actually cause the top of the flask to shoot off. <laughs> so just danger. Don't be me. So um, <laughs> if you're going to use noon, I would just put it in a wider mouth bottle. Other awesome. questions? Yes, ma'am. I have a question more on training. How do you feel about uh, cross training versus just run, run, run? Because I kind of heard both <laughs> yes, arguments. Always cross train. Huh? Always cross train. I think yeah. everybody advocates that nowadays because you can get, you can actually get a great cross transfer between biking and running, particularly if your bike is set up correctly, and you can put on, you know, take off half your miles almost if you're going to increase your bike running. It depends on if you have injuries too. It's mm -hmm. wonderful to be able to do the cross training, uh, but the bike run thing is is excellent. It's just a nice way to feed your leg strength and your uh, and if you train correctly on a bike, which means you don't coast downhill, you know, and do a lot of things where you're resting, um, you can get wonderful heart rate training as well. And you can use your heart rate monitor on the bike, and you know exactly where you are. So You'll find out you're not riding hard enough. Replacing some of the weekly runs with a cross training, or just adding on. Well, I, I substitute. I, I used substitute. to substitute when I was running a lot. Um, I would substitute the biking for a good portion of my running, and but my quality of running was much higher then. I didn't do a lot of those long, slow things, like the Galloway people or whoever it was said you're supposed to do that. I never could have quite figure that ethic out either. I like to run fast, and I like to run a little harder. So then I just use the bike to make up for the slow runs. Work most of the time. I think it also depends on, these are all really great points, I think it also depends on where you are in your training cycle. Mm -hmm. So if you're training for New York, we're looking at what, 18 days? We're inside 18 days now? Ooh, ooh, now ooh. is not the time to start cross training. Mm -hmm. Incorporate it into your next training cycle. If you'd like to incorporate cross training as you taper back and just do some yoga or some mat-based Pilates, that's probably great. You won't run the risk of like stretching or straining or anything like that. Um, I would say, going forward into your next training cycle, if you'd like to incorporate <coughs> other activities, I strongly recommend body weight strength. Um, basic stuff, burpees, push-ups, planks, core stuff. Um, it's a really terrific uh, athlete named Chris Mosier. Some of you guys might know him. He's a really spectacular guy. Um, is actually publishes a, a deck a day workout that you can use with a deck of cards app that's just different functional strength exercises every day you can do in your home, you can do in your office as long as people don't mind too much. Like, I would incorporate functional body weight strength and then as you begin to ramp your training back up again, then perhaps look to incorporate instead of doing like, um, you know, a Tuesday after your uh, speed work, let's say speed works Monday, Tuesday instead of doing like five or six miles, Maybe you go out for 10 miles on your bike, or you take a spin class, or you do some functional strength. I can personally speak to that, and I'm going to knock on whatever lumber is available here. <laughs> um, I, uh, I joined November Project three and a half years ago, and I go twice a week probably, and I have not had any of the um, uh, strength and balances or problems that I had uh, leading up to that. It's been really great, and for the most part, I run over to those workouts, I do that workout and I come home rather than doing like 10 miles hard. I do six miles with some strength and I've been the better for it. But right now, especially if you're heading into taper, now is not the time to go, I'm going to CrossFit. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and CrossFit has its benefits, it does. Um, mm -hmm. But now is probably not. CrossFit is also known as the orthopedic surgeon's delight. <laughs> <laughs> Drag him. <laughs> yeah, my PT doesn't have, he doesn't let my coach have me run more than four days a week. Because I get runner's knee. Yes, ma'am? So um, I ran last year, ran a marathon last year, and, um, and that was my first like foray into running. Mm -hmm. I pre previously only run four miles at a time, and so it was a major accomplishment. Congratulations. Um, thanks. And doing it again, um, I have only run 18 a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So I was sick this weekend, and most of my friends and most of my team ran 20. There are a few of us that were injured or were sick, and we're not sure is it way too late to, you know, even though it's only a couple of days, is it too late to run 20? 
Should and we really be tapering? You've done, a, you've done 20s before leading up to your marathon I've done, last year? I did, nope, I only did 18 last year as well. Okay. But I had a lot more injury stuff going on last year, so but, I was... But this year you've been relatively healthy other than... Mostly. ...the illness that knocked you out. Yeah. Of, okay. Um, Honestly, given your recovery time, you could do one of two things. You could get the 20 in, but you'd probably need to back off a lot sooner, like your, your taper would need to be more aggressive. What you might actually want to try, and, and Brooks Hansen's is really big on this, and they have some great success with it, a 16 as a slice down. So you do it, like think about it as four four mile runs together, and the first four are at let's say 30 minutes, 30, 30 minutes, 30 seconds slower than marathon goal pace, and then you start slicing time off. 30, and then it's 15 seconds slower than marathon goal pace, and then it's at marathon goal pace, and then the last four are 15 seconds faster than marathon goal pace, because that'll simulate the fatigue that you would get from the additional four miles. It'll have you running strong through the last little bit, but it won't overly fatigue you and it'll be easier to recover from. That might be, um, especially if it's on a hilly course, that might be a nice, um, a nice way to, to, to wrap up your training. And then you can just go into your taper with cutting back by 25%, cutting back by 50%. And one other thing on taper that I will say that I, I know a lot of first timers make this mistake. When you look at marathon week, make sure that your mileage, when you include the marathon, does not exceed your highest week. So if your highest week was only 50 miles, and I say only because that's a lot, some people will train on 35 to 45. Think of it like I already ran 26.2 that week. How many more miles do I have to play with? It's very common for people to overshoot the runway. Oh, I'm training 35 miles a week. Well, I just did another 20 during the week of the marathon, and then I did the mi marathon. You're like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You overshot the runway on that one. And people don't think about it that way. Think about it as those miles are already in the bank. What else do I have to play with? And it's always better to go into something slightly undercooked than overdone in general. Other questions, or are we? Well, I want to be sensitive. Everyone. Oh, time, absolutely. So we okay. can, you know, we can continue the discussion around drinks if you guys would like. You're more than welcome to ask some more questions. Um, but thank you all for coming out. Um, thank you to the panel, and really appreciate thank it. You. Nice thank being you. here. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.